Welcome to New York State's Hudson River Valley. The Hudson River is about 315 miles long. It is named after Henry Hudson, also who founded Hudson Bay, who first explored the river in the year 1609. It wasn't looking for a development or a settlement. He was looking for a Northwest Passage to the Far East. The Hudson River is a place that I know well, having grown up on a town just north of New York City along the Hudson River. Many of you have crossed or gone under the Hudson River onto your way to New York City or beyond. But the Hudson River is more than New York City. It holds a special place in the history of our nation from the time of first settlement through the American Revolution to the Industrial Revolution and the opening of the central part of the United States. Today, I hope you will learn more about the, this river and the region that surrounds it. Looking at this map I have on the screen, you'll see the Hudson River starts way up in upstate New York. It is fed by another river called the Mohawk River, and it has a wide drainage area in multiple states, the light area. But it has a very significant role in the United States, particularly the Revolutionary War. During the Revolutionary War, the Hudson River and that area that I have in an oval, which depicts uh, Lake Champlain, were critical to putting down, from the English standpoint, the uprising in New England. The British plan was to have a mighty armada, and they had a mighty armada sail into New York Harbor down there at the base coming in from the Atlantic and sail up the Hudson River all the way to an area just beyond Albany, New York. At the same time, the British were bringing forces down through Lake Champlain and all the way down to Albany. The idea was to cut off New England by having this demarcation line between the North and the South. Why did they want to do this? Because there were a number of English, uh, shall we say, sympathizers in the South, and the South was very highly dependent upon trade with England. You will hear later why the British plan was not successful. We begin our journey today in the lower part of the Hudson River. In fact, it's not quite correct to call it a river, at least technically. It should be called an estuary. Why? Because all the way from the Atlantic Ocean all the way up to that dashed line below a place called Troy, New York, it is tidal. While at Troy, the tide might only move an inch or two, it moves a great deal further along the river as you head south. You'll see a town called Poughkeepsie. They're about halfway up to Troy. From the Atlantic Ocean up to Poughkeepsie, the river is salt water. It becomes a mixture of salt water between Gypsy and Troy, New York. We all know that New York City was originally named New Amsterdam because it was settled by the Dutch. The English only allowed the Dutch to stay in New York City for about 27 years when they forced them out. 
and New York was renamed after the English Duke of York. What most people don't know is the English might have driven the Dutch out of New York City, although you'll see there's lasting remnants of the Dutch having been there. They did not drive them out of the area north of New York City, going all the way up the Hudson River Valley to a point called Albany. The Hudson River for many years was known as the New Netherlands. Even George Washington called it that. It was so entrenched in Dutch culture and language that the Native Americans who lived in the area not only spoke their native language, but many of them spoke Dutch. And when English settlers came in, they'd have to find a Dutchman to do the translation. The area has always been populated by a small Christian denomination known as the Dutch Reformed Church, a church which I grew up in as a youngster. It wasn't until the late 1800s that ministers from these churches came from the local population. Prior to that, they imported ministers from the Netherlands. It's always good to start from a known location, and if you haven't been to New York City, you've certainly seen pictures. You'll recognize all the skyscrapers. We have a number of residents here at CLV who grew up in the New York area, and I will leave it to them to do a in-depth presentation on the New York City area. Today, I'm only going to discuss its relationship to the Hudson River, which is on the left, and New York City's early beginnings. The Hudson River empties into the Atlantic Ocean between Brooklyn and Staten Island, also known as Richmond. This is the Verrazano Bridge. This is the Narrows coming into the upper harbor of New York City. The area beyond the bridge is the lower harbor of New York City, that land which is the darker blue out there is part of New Jersey. One of the traditions of ships that come to New York Harbor for the first time is to be greeted by fireboats spouting uh, red, blue, and white colors welcoming the, to the harbor. I've been very lucky to have been on the battleship Iowa after it was recommissioned and the first time going into New York Harbor. We were greeted by contingents of boats, particularly the fireboats, greeting us with those huge sprays of water and all sorts of helicopters. I was on board because we took a cruise from the Naval War College, which I was attending, in Rhode Island, out into the Atlantic, and then back in New York. Along the way, we got to fire those massive guns you see in the lower left. They fire a projectile that's about the size of a Volkswagen. Uh, so you can see in the other picture some of my foreign uh, classmates that were on the trip also. We now enter the upper New York Harbor. You can see Manhattan off to the right. <clears throat> the buildings off to the left beyond the Statue of Liberty, that is New Jersey. Upon entering the harbor, you see the Statue of Liberty on the port side, a gift from France. The physical features of the Statue of Liberty carry significant meaning. 
The broken shackles at liberty's feet signify a breaking away from tyranny and oppression. The seven rays on her crown stand for the seven continents of the world. Each are about nine foot long and weigh 150 pounds. We're all knowledgeable about the fact that at the base there is a poem. It, the inscription, I should say. I am very I've always been very impressed because I am the son of immigrants with this inscription. It says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. New York has traditionally been a melting pot that welcomes immigrants. Anyway, that's, that's the end of the inscription. But what I'm saying is New York has traditionally over been a melting pot that has welcomed immigrants and empowered them to fan out across this country and make mighty contributions. And that they have. Looking beyond the Statue of Liberty, you'll see another island. It's called Ellis Island. The building on the left is where immigrants were processed. Ellis Island was known as the Island of Hope or the Island of Dreams. In the late 1800s, the United States found it, found it to be important to screen all incoming immigrants before allowing them into the country. Those that were sick or had criminal records were either sent back to their native lands or were housed until they were well enough to enter the country. Because of the chance of rejection, some immigrants coined Ellis Island, Heartbreak Island, or Island of Tears. Of the 12 million people who passed through its doors, between 1892 and 1954, only 2% were deemed unfit to become U.S. citizens, mostly because of not being mentally fit. One of the things that can confound a genealogist was that new immigrants could change their name when they were admitted to the United States. Most shortened or anglicized their name, but a few took other names. Before we start up the Hudson River, I want to share an insight as to the health of the river today. When I was growing up in the area in the 1940s and 50s, you did not dare go anywhere near the Hudson River. It was extremely polluted and deadly to fish and humans. Thanks to an effort of organizations and the state of New York and New Jersey, that is no longer true. The slide on the right versus the slide on the left show the significant improvement in the health of the river. The slide on the right goes back to 2013. That green area is also blue today. The change has been so dramatic that fish and whales have returned to the lower harbor. And once again, oysters and other shellfish are being harvested. Blue crabs have also come back. Back to the famous New York skyline. You may have learned as a child that Manhattan, where all those skyscrapers are, was purchased from the local natives for $24. 
Uh, there are two things wrong historically with that story. First, the original settlement was not on Manhattan. It was Governor's Island, which is in the foreground, this small island just to the left of that cruise ship. The Dutch thought they'd bought Governor's Island, but the local neighbors did not have a concept of owning land, and they thought the, 24, the trinkets worth $24 were a peace offering. The Dutch only stayed, well, they stayed permanently, but they moved over from Governor's Island to Manhattan after about 18 months of living on Governor's Island. This is a drawing of the original settlement on the lower portion of Manhattan Island. If you'll notice the wall all the way to the right of the drawing, it was there to protect the settlement. Today, we know the area where the wall was as being the famous Wall Street or the stock market. The names of many areas and streets in New York City can be traced back to Dutch influence in the area. Particularly, you'll see a canal that's better known today as Canal Street. This is an artist's rendition of what Manhattan Island looked like prior to colonization. It had lakes and a nice bunch of trees. But that green, the green lines that go out into the water, they signify the extent of Manhattan Island today. Manhattan Island has grown in size. It did so because when the subway was constructed underground, they needed to do something with all of the rock and dirt. And so it was, was dumped along the shore and thus Manhattan Island grew in size. Manhattan Island has come a long way from those early colonist days. This is the tip where the original settlement was built. Today, that green area down there is known as the Battery because the Dutch originally put large guns there. It's also the home of where the, you can see on the lower right, I know it, you probably won't, there's a ferry boat going in there that goes over to Staten Island. We're going to start proceeding up the Hudson River, and this is along the west side of Manhattan as you go forth. It's an area called the Chelsea Piers, where in my youth, I used to, when our families were going back over to the UK, I would go down to see them off. There were a series of long docks, and they accommodated the ocean liners, particularly in the late 40s and 50s, that were the main transport of one somebody wanting to travel to Europe. As I said, I had been down there many times. The, the road to the, the right is called used to be called the West Side Highway. And there was one time I was on the ship in the foreground, it's the United, US United States. And I had got on because family always traveled in, in, in tourist or steerage. And somehow I got over into the first class area and couldn't get back. I'll always remember I went into a panic boat and finally somebody got me off the ship back onto the dock. And then I got back onto the steerage area. Let's begin our trip upriver.
Today, those areas along the river where the ships used to dock are no longer there. The ships now dock, the cruise ships, not because very few ships, uh, ships except the Queen Mary, go between the United States and Europe. But mostly cruise ships are now in Brooklyn. By the way, Brooklyn is a Dutch name. In a place, a pedestrian walkaway, walkway and bicycle path has been built going north along the banks. I've also taken the West Side Highway away. It's known as the Greenway. This path goes from the lower Manhattan down by the what we call the Battery all the way up through Manhattan, through the Bronx, through the town of Yonkers where I grew up, all the way up to the Tappan Sea Bridge at Terrytown, New York, a 24 mile ride. You can then go across the Tappan Sea Bridge and come down on the New Jersey side to the George Washington Bridge and come back over it into New York City. Some of the piers that were there that the mighty ships would dock have now been turned into recreation areas. Before we leave New York, I want to digress with, with what I consider an engineering marvel. The New York City water supply system. It provides one and a half billion gallons of safe drinking water to nine million residents of the New York City area every day. It starts upstate and comes down through a number of channels. So you'd say tunnels. Today, an amazing system of reservoirs, which I used to fish in as a kid, lakes and aqueducts and water mains distribute that 1.5 billion gallons of water every day. This is one of the tunnels. It is 24 foot in diameter. And it runs from a reservoir up near White Plains, New York, called Kensico, to a place called Van Cortland, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, because it was an area where I grew up. A lot of water flushing through those tunnels. Back to the Hudson River. This is a steamboat. Yes, it was called the Hudson River Dayliner. And it used to leave New York City come up the Hudson River, stop at the town I grew up in, in Yonkers. And every summer, my family and some other families would get on the boat and we'd cruise up the river to a place called Bear Mountain, which we'll visit later. This ship was built in Sparrows Point. It was the highlight of the summer. Moving up the Greenway, you can see people now fish. Wouldn't have done that when I was growing up, along the way. And we come to the George Washington Bridge, better known as a traffic jam if you're going from uh, the New Jersey Turnpike and trying to head up into New England on I-95. The George Washington Bridge was built in the early 1930s. But to increase capacity in 1962, they built a lower level. So there's two levels to the bridge. I found it interesting when doing some research. I didn't know this growing up. The upper level is known as the George Washington Bridge. The lower level is known as the Martha Washington level. 
you're looking at the Manhattan side of the bridge, but if you were to look at the tower holding up the bridge on the New Jersey side, on major holidays, the arch has a, an American flag. It is one of the largest American flags flown. It weighs over 450 pounds and is 90 feet by 60 feet. Need to point out, there's a little red image there at the base of the George Washington on the Manhattan side. It's a lighthouse. When I was growing up, there was a book that was very popular in the New York area among children about the little red lighthouse. In the early 1950s, the lighthouses along the Hudson River uh, were maintained by the U.S. Coast Guard. They decided to close it down. The lighthouse was there because there's a shoal and you wanted to keep the larger ships away from running aground on that shoal. So they closed, the Coast Guard decided to close this lighthouse. Well, there was a massive campaign by school children in the New York area. And that lighthouse still burns bright, not by the Coast Guard, but by an association that was incorporated to keep that lighthouse running. Near the George Washington Bridge and going to the north of the George Washington Bridge are these massive cliffs on the New Jersey side extending up into New York State. And there is a trail along the Hudson River edge there below the cliffs, which as a youngster, uh, I would go with friends that we do overnight or overnight and over day camping along the river. The cliffs are known as the Palisades. Uh, they are bluffs that are between 200 to 500 feet tall and they extend along the Hudson River for about 35 miles. They can be traced back to almost 300 billion years ago. During my youth, this is the view from Yonkers where I grew up and I can see the river and see the Palisades. When I grew up, there was a ferry that would use to go from Yonkers across to the Palisades with a guy that played an accordion and had a monkey. Another digression. I grew up in Yonkers, New York, which is just north of the Bronx. You can see a little heart there below Yonkers that indicates where I physically lived. Many of you have heard of Yonkers, but really don't know much about it. You may have heard of it because it was famous in Holo Dolly, but it has another claim to fame that most of you have known. It was the home and where Otis invented the Otis elevator. And elevators were produced in Yonkers until 1950, where they moved, when they moved elsewhere. When I grew up, this is Yonkers to the left. You can see down, down river, the skyline of Manhattan. It didn't look pretty like this when I grew up. Yonkers was, the west side of Yonkers was pretty poor. A lot of immigrant families. Uh, as uh, time went on, part of the Bronx moved up into Yonkers and there was a lot of crime. There was a lot of social unrest, but that has ch changed. New Yorkers discovered Yonkers again. And they've built these very high or expensive uh, buildings along the river. So much so 
that there are now high-speed uh, water taxis that take people from Yonkers down to Manhattan. This is the oldest structure in Yonkers. It was built around 1682 by a Dutch-born merchant and trader called Frederick Philps. Today, Philps Manor is a museum and it has an, a link to Carol Lutheran Village. You might remember our previous executive director here at CLV, George Ox. His wife, Sandy, was the director of the museum here. And George had a job at a local retirement community, Young Yonkers. You may remember Sandy from her job as director of the Carroll Arts Center. There are the Palisades again and the Hudson River. This is just down from the high school that I attended in Yonkers. And so every day I would look out and see the Hudson River and depending upon the weather and the wind and the, and the season, the river would change. And that always amazed me, change in color and, and dimensions and all sorts of different ways. As I say, I grew up in Yonkers. The arrow points to the house where I grew up at 20 Hancock. You may not see it, but off to the left where all those trees are, there's a, a faint green line. On the right side is the city of Yonkers. On the left side is the borough of Bronx, New York City. All those trees are in New York City. It is a large forested area known as Van Cortlandt Park. It was my play area. This is an outline of the park. That pink X up there is where I lived. And I spent days particularly in the summer, just exploring this large, large park. It is over 1,500 acres. And through the lens of the park, you can see history, Revolutionary War history, places where Indians used to camp down along that water area. A place where I could find arrowheads. A place where I could be one with nature. This is a satellite picture of the park and you can see the density of the woods. Again, the red arrow is where I lived. I might point out that outside that red boundary, there is a cemetery to the right, and it's called Woodlawn Cemetery. And there are quite a few notables that are buried there. I'd like to mention just a few. Herman Medville, and Moby Dick, a number of musicians, Miles Davis, Duke Ellington, George M. Cohan, Irving Berlin, and some folks that you've heard about. R. H. Macy, the founder of Macy's. James C. Penny, F. W. Woolworth, and a naval hero, Admiral Farragut. Back to my private forest. There were lots of trails and rocky hills to climb. I would spend my days here. I would spend all my days. Probably wouldn't want to go to school, but unfortunately that didn't happen.
It was a lake in the middle of the forest. And in the summer, my friends and I would build rafts and we would go fishing from them. In the winter, the lake froze over and it was our private ice skating rink. Enough about my past. I just love the area where I grew up. This is the Bronx, by the way. It's not tenements. It's nature at its best. There were deer, there were pheasants, and yes, we had copperhead snakes. Back to the river. Again, remind you that looks like nice, pure water. Uh, at this point in our trip, that is tidal and salt water. You'll see a road there on the left side of the picture and then some rail lines. Those rail lines were important to me growing up. My father worked for the New York Central Railroad. And one of the benefits of doing so was he had a pass. And trust me, I used that pass. All those red lines are places that I could go on the New York Central Railroad. And trust me, I went to many of them. Again, you'll see how the river meanders. The river is very, very deep. At one point where we get up towards West Point, it's over 300 foot deep. As such, ocean going vessels can come in and go as far north as Albany. We arrive at another bridge going across the Hudson. Some of you may have got across it. It's called the Tappan Zee Bridge. It's a way of connecting, another way of connecting up without going to, 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 uh, through New York City to get to I-95 and go on into New England. It connects between Nyack, New York, and Tarrytown, New York. In this picture, you'll actually, there are two bridges there. Uh, there's a new one with those tall towers, suspension type bridge, and another bridge on the other side. The bridge on the other side was built for the New York State Thruway in, it was opened in 1952. And as a child, I watched them build that bridge. It's very sad to me today that bridge is being torn down because they built the new one, which has much greater uh, capacity. We talked about the Dutch, the Dutch having influence north of New York City. Many of you growing up may have read books about Sleepy Hollow, made famous by stories like The Headless Horseman and Rip Van Winkle. There's The Headless Horseman for you and the bridge that he used to cross. This is a Dutch church, or as I said, Dutch Reformed Church, which I grew up in. It's in Sleepy Hollow, and you might notice its architecture. I used to like to use a lot of the natural stone from the area. But if you look in its windows, the Dutch Reformed Church, like a lot of Presbyterian churches, do not have stained glass windows. The reason they don't is because they believe the light of God needs to shine in on the people within the sanctuary. This is an old Dutch settlement house. A very wealthy landowner owned this one. But it is typical Dutch architecture. When I look at this picture, it's again in 
going up through the Hudson River Valley. It is typical Dutch, and having lived near the Netherlands in Belgium, it transports me back to the Netherlands. It has such a Dutch flavor. This is Sing Sing Prison, New York State's notorious prison located at Ossining, New York. It's along the Hudson River Valley, Hudson River, I should say. Uh, by the way, the Hudson River does, or used to when I grew up, freeze over. And so that's why it's white in front of it. The term that was used many years ago was being sent up the river. You were being sent up the river to Sing Sing Prison. It was constructed way back in 1820, at least initially, by inmate labor. Sing Sing has been the model for many gangster movies, which created a image of harsh prison culture. North State's electric chair was located in Sing Sing. And there's a strip of land that goes out into the Hudson River that there are some folks have cabins during the summer. And I was there on a summer evening in 1953 when Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were executed. I've always been against capital punishment. After World War II, there were a lot of surplus ships, and they found an anchorage upriver in the Hudson, about 50 miles up from New York City. And there they remained until the late 1980s when they were sold for scrap. But all those years they were maintained in a condition that they could have sailed in three days. We now come to a place where the river narrows, but gets very deep, as I said, over 300 feet. This is West Point. As I mentioned early in the presentation, the English intended to go up the Hudson River as far as Albany and Troy and forming a line to prevent supplies to coming in from the south into in the New England. They ran into a problem. Across that very, very narrow area, the revolutionary forces put chains, floating chains, across the river. And on either side of the river, they put massive guns. The English fleet came up the river and they couldn't get to a point to cut the chains because of the bombardment from the guns. The revolutionary forces almost failed. The English almost got through. And the reason they almost got through is they learned about the chains and they were prepared to cut them. How did they learn about the chains? The commanding officer, at the time it was not West Point, it was a army base, or a revolutionary army base, commanded by an individual that you heard about as a youth. His name was Benedict Arnold. He gave the plans to the English and then went over to become a general in the English army. But the guns kept the English away, and they were never able to cut off New England. This, if you go to West Point today, the picture on the right is the actual chains 
that were floated across the river. We now go further up the river in another bridge. It's called Bear Mountain Bridge, a place that I've gone across many, many times as a youth. We come to a state park called Bear Mountain State Park. Bear Mountain State Park, in my memory, is always associated with these two ski jumps. In the summer, I would walk all the way up to the top and stand up there where the skiers would start their going downhill and think, could I do this? And the answer was no. You'll see the Olympic sign over to the, to the right, and that's for many years before uh, the training facility in Colorado was put together, uh, skiers would come here to train for the Olympics. I mentioned that ships go up the Hudson River to Albany. And there are shoals along the river, and to keep the ships safe, there are a number of lighthouses that were maintained by the U.S. Coast Guard. Today, these are unmanned lighthouses, but still very picturesque. I'm sure you recognize the 32nd President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his wife. This is on the grounds of Hyde Park, where he had a house. Hyde Park today is a national park, and it is the first presidential library. It is a large area, over a thousand acres of gardens and trails. We continue up the river. Looking out over the river, we are seeing an area called the Catskill Mountains. It is part of the Appalachian Trail, but it is in southeast New York. It is an area of over 700,000 acres of preserved forest protected from development by New York state law. The Catskills were named by the early Dutch settlers. They were also known in American society as a setting for films and many artworks, including 19th century Hudson River School of Paintings. And it was also a favored destination of veg vacationers from New York City. The region's many large resorts gave countless young stand-up comics an opportunity to hone their craft. The Catskills have long been a haven for artists, musicians, writers, and especially in and around the towns of Phoenicia and Woodstock. These are some of the comedians that honed their craft at the Catskill Resorts. I've shown a couple, Milton Berle, Don Rickles, Penny Youngman, Buddy Hackett, Sid Caesar, Mel Books, but there are others, George Burns, Carl Reiner, Jack Benny, Jerry Lewis, Phil Silvers, Roger, Rodney Dangerfield. That's just to name a few. This is a very attractive picture of Albany. Albany doesn't look as good when you get downtown. But Albany has a rich history dating back to more than 400 years ago. Even before that, it was a major trading area for Native Americans. 
when Henry Hudson arrived in 1609, uh, the Indians had a major encampment here and the Dutch established a trading post. In 1797, Albany became the official capital of New York State and has been a trading center for banking, railroads, and international trade. Four presidents of the United States have lived here when they were governors of New York State. It's also famous for the fact that the telegraph, the electric motor, and celluloid plastic were all invented here. Albany was also the point of origin for the first long distance airplane flight and passenger railroad. Just north of Albany, again on the Hudson River, is the town of Troy, New York. And there's a dam. This is where tidal, the tidal part of the Hudson River ends. It's brackish water to the south of the dam and fresh water to the north. The bam, dam was built because in the spring, the Hudson River, the upper reaches would flood and would flood the areas of Troy and Albany. And so the dam prevents that flooding. You'll see in this map, all the way to the right, Albany and Troy. And then you'll see a squiggly line going across all the way over to Lake Erie. This is the Erie Canal. It's a historic waterway. It connected New York City. Remember, ocean-going boats could come all the way up to Albany with the Great Lakes and beyond into the central part of the United States. Part of the way, the canal takes advantage of the river I mentioned earlier, the Mohawk River. The canal is 363 miles long. It was completed in 1825. Its success propelled New York City into a major commercial center and encouraged canal building across the United States. Today you can traverse the canal, it's still operable, but you can also do it the way they did back then with mule drawn barges. To the north of the canal is the Adirondack Mountains. And the Hudson River leads us to the Adirondacks. It is a massive area in northeastern New York State. It covers 5,000 5, square miles. The mountains cover form sort of a rough circular dome, which is about 160 miles in diameter. Mountains can go up to one mile high. There are over 200 lakes in the area. Some of them you've heard of, Lake George, Lake Placid, but there's also Lake Tear, Tear in the Clouds. It's on Mount Marcy which is where the Hudson River starts. This is the Adirondacks. It's a place for many, many years, Carol and I used to go on vacation. Some gorgeous, again, but very rugged terrain. You can get lost out there in those mountains. It's a great place to visit in the fall. <clears throat> Some of you know Ann Wickersham, a resident here at CLV. She spent a good deal of her early life here in the Adirondacks on one of the lakes. Again, 
this time of year, it's gorgeous to be in the Adirondacks. This is where the Hudson River starts. As a child, I know some folks that lived in the area, and I have very warm memories of going swimming in this part of the Hudson River. The far part north of the Adirondacks is a place that you've heard of. It's called Lake Placid, the home to the Winter Olympics. Also the home to the miracle on the ice when the United States won the ice hockey, hockey tournament. We now move over onto the border between New York State and Vermont. And this is Lake Champlain. They say Vermont is across the river, those mountains. During the War of 1812, which we tried to go into Canada to take some land, there was a battle called the Battle of Plattsburgh on Lake Champlain between the US and the British. It was the first time we had a fleet and it destroyed the British squadron and stopped the British from moving south. If they had not won that battle, this part of New York State would probably have been part of Canada. We moved to the southern part of Lake Champlain and Fort Ticonderoga. During the Revolutionary War, this was extremely important. Three major battles occurred here that set the tenure for the Revolutionary War. This is another lake. This is one of the other, you can go from, by a canal from Champlain into Lake George. Many CLV residents went there a number of years ago uh, on a, a trip up in this area. And it's an area that, again, I know well. My uncle lived just south of Lake George in Glens Falls. And I used to go there very frequently as a child. Uh, today is not my favorite area. There are too many New Yorkers. I'm a New Yorker. I don't love New Yorkers. We're getting to the end of the presentation. I hope that you've seen that there are two sides of New York State, particularly through our journey up the Hudson River. In the center of this picture is Manhattan. Hudson River, and then over in New Jersey, on the foreground is Brooklyn. Very densely populated. And that's an image that sometimes I hear from people when they talk about New York. But New York is a very, very green state with lots of protected areas. It's a rural state. It's totally different upstate from New York State, from down New York City. Need to, at this point, end the presentation and sadly announce this will be my last presentation at CLV. Carol and I will be leaving CLV the end of December. We're building a new home just north of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The reason we're moving is we wanted a home of our own. There's some rumors around that we may be coming, leaving, I should say, for other reasons, but the primary reason is we want a new home. But let me say the last six and a half years have been a joy. We have loved Carol Lutheran because of the people. You, the residents, make Carol Lutheran. Be active, continue to make this the place that it should be and is.
enjoy your life here by being active and being part of the community. We're going to leave many friends, but we're going to only be about 40 minutes away and we will journey back to visit friends. So thank you very much for listening. I've done 14 of these presentations. I hope that you've enjoyed them. I know I have enjoyed putting them together and presenting them. Thank you very much. Have a great day and stay safe.